Okay, so uh, today I'm talking to Angela Puka, who uh, is one of the keynote speakers at the forthcoming uh, symposium in September. Uh, she's probably known to most people, I think, as the anchor for a very successful podcast on YouTube and uh, other platforms. Um, so I forgot to wrote, write down what it is. It's just called An Angela Puka. Is, is the podcast just called Angela Puka or is it just have a, a It's name? called the Angela Symposium. The Angela Symposium, yeah, which is, uh, you know, definitely worth checking out. It has... It has a few more subscribers than we do. It has uh, it has about ninety thousand last time I looked subscribers, which is well a lot, and uh, over several hundred uh, videos. So that's a great resource. And I know of uh, Angela from friends really who go around the world who sort of uh, either are fans of the podcast or want to be Angela Puka, really. They want to do the same sort of thing in their country. Uh, <coughs> or, you know... What? Really? Are there, <laughs> are there uh, Angela yeah. Puka wannabes? <laughs> yeah, they like the approach, apparently. Um, uh, any other person, I know someone in the Far East and stuff like that. Yeah, they said they'd really like... They, they appreciate it, and they think that that would be good in another language, basically, you know, but to be doing the same thing. So they obviously appreciate what you're doing. Uh, so, right. Angela, would you, before we go on to what you're going to sort of talk about, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you, who you are and uh, from your point of view <laughs> and uh, what your kind of overall trajectory or aim in life might be in terms of this sort of context. So I'm Dr. Angela Puka. I have um, a PhD in religious studies and uh, I've been lecturing at uh, different universities worldwide for a few years now and uh, have been based in Leeds, at Leeds Trinity University since uh, 2016. Uh, so I teach there and uh, I also have, um, uh, as you mentioned, I have an online project of delivering uh, free academic scholarship on topics in historicism. Uh, topics in paganism, shamanism, um, and everything occult uh, based on peer-reviewed academic sources because I thought that it was something that was lacking. Um, there are many channels and many podcasts that talk about aestheticism, but um, none un until, you know, the, the few group that I'm part of that we call ourselves Religion Tube. Uh, of course, there's also um, uh, Aesthetica, my friend, uh, Justin Sledge, uh, but uh, before us, that we started around the same time, uh, there wasn't really uh, much. And uh, I think that my project is um, uh, is unique in that it uh, I only use peer-reviewed academic scholarship, uh, whereas uh, perhaps there are others that tend to do their analysis on primary sources, which is also fine. Uh, but I I try to to stick to what the academic research says because that is just my methodological decision of how to go about um, things because I think that I wanted to make it less about me and more about the, the research to be honest uh, so I, I I find it funny that people when they watch my videos they think that that's what I think and it's not what I think it's what research says so it, it might very well be something that I don't agree with on a personal level but my project is not about what I personally think it's about what the research says um, so I'm not sure whether in the future I will be a bit more open about my own opinions. Sometimes they come through a bit more during live streams, like when I do questions and answers. And uh, certainly with my Patreon community, I'm much more open about my my personal views with my, my patrons. But on my public online platform, I tend to just stick to what the, the research says without trying to, to keep to a minimum um, personal interpretations and uh, uh, completely avoiding personal opinions. Okay. Well, look, I was just looking at having a quick sort of uh, look on the, on the podcast. And the one that's at the top of the podcast, it says left-hand path course 
a course in left hand path how does that is that still an academic course i mean i was kind of i don't know i was kind of i suppose to say slightly surprised or intrigued by that that you could actually have a course on the left hand path obviously left hand path right hand path is the kind of stuff that gets tossed around the occult scene all the time and pretty much my point of view come in as i do you know as a one-time member of a tantric order still a member of a tantric order called a moo course and you know you often get asked what's the left that's supposed to be definitive of the left hand path in a way the kind of hindu tradition where it comes from that's one way but I, you know, primarily, I think everybody's left hand path, really. I think anybody who's practicing magic or the occult or thinking about these ideas, it's, I don't know what what right hand path version of it would look like. Because from a sort of Hindu point of view, if, if you're practicing magic, then you're by definition on the left hand path, I would have thought. You're by, by definition a, a tantric. That's how everybody would see you. Anyway, but what what's the that what's that course about then you know the left hand path course from your point of view well it's not my point of view as i clarified earlier yeah. and i think that there's a bit of confusion uh when we try to define things first of all when you say how can you do a uh, a course that is academic on the left hand path well as long as there is research any any topic can be studied academically there aren't really topics that academia or scientific research doesn't study and if there are there should be studies <laughs> so it's um anything can be approached from a practitioner's point of view or from an academic point of view now the definition that you gave of left hand path is your own uh, opinion and definition and the way that academics tend to define things is more looking at um how the the term has been used across different times in history and across different traditions and they come up with something that is not um doesn't have an individual bias but is uh, a bit more uh super partis as we would say in latin or a bit more objective a bit more neutral it's a neutral way of understanding what it is uh so the left hand path is something very specific and uh i i have a, a dedicated video on my youtube channel on that and of course i go into much deeper length in my online course if people are interested but left hand path analyzed from a scholarly uh, perspective is an umbrella term that um, under which there are uh, traditions and practices that have certain elements in common. And I would say that not all historic practices are left hand path, definitely not. Uh, so the, the, the key principles that identify a tradition or a practice as left hand path are um, individual individualism so the, the fact that there is a focus on the individual as opposed to the community um the self deification the fact that the uh, main aim or one of the main aims of the practice is to become a living god um the um, appraisal of the here and now there's a focus on the material side of existence and the here and now and even uh, there's also uh, an element of hedonism especially in the west the tantric form of left hand path is different from the left the the left hand path in western historicism so my course covers primarily uh, le left hand path traditions in western historicism even though i have the second lecture that is about tantra more specifically so that people have an understanding of what left hand path in tantra is and uh, it, it definitely has differences from left hand path in the western world then we have um the antinomianism the rejection of um dogmas and the rejections of norms uh, so a left hand path uh, tradition or practice tends to be more um, rebellious in nature you could say so there's a rejection of um, norms and rejection of rules and so it would make it not particularly easy to be institutionalized i wouldn't say uh, there are some left hand path traditions that have um orders but uh, they still uh, try and keep these they are they still include these principles for sure so you do have right hand path historic traditions one that i that comes to mind is shamanism for instance shamanism has such a strong emphasis on the community on serving the community that to me that's very right hand path also the idea of um uh worshipping a, a, an entity a deity and seeing a deity as above yourself that would be more of a right hand path perspective as opposed to a left hand path that is more about 
I am a living God. And um, th there tends to be in those type of traditions more the idea of expanding yourself to the state of God as opposed to worshipping something that is external and is above you. So it is a different perspective. I'm not saying that the typology of right hand path and left hand path is necessarily useful. I know that many people argue against it and it's fine. I'm working with it as a methodological tool, but I'm not asserting that it is something mm. essential for people. It is a useful typology in certain way and perhaps it's less useful in, in other ways, but uh, I find it useful because it um, because there are definitely traditions that present those principles and that are different from other traditions that don't present such principles. Wicca could be another example that I, I had a discussion with my patrons and there was one who said, is Wicca right hand path or left hand path? And I think that with Wicca, for instance, it depends. So you could have forms of Wicca that are more right hand path, more community based, community oriented, and um, uh, and also in their approach with the with the deities that are more right, right hand path as opposed to others that are left hand path. So I I just see as a methodol methodology to explore certain traditions to through that specific lens. And in my online course, in case people are interested, I, I cover these traditions and these practices. There are also lectures on demonology and demonolatry. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a very quick and concise description. So what would be the kind of academic authorities for that, for the, behind that? Who's who's you. Go on, go on. There isn't there isn't one authority, of course, on the left hand path, um, but uh, there are a few uh, there are a few publications that have been uh, published on the left hand path. You you find a few in my video on the um, I have a video called "What is the left hand path" on my YouTube channel. So if you look at the description box of all my videos, you will find academic um, references. So there are a few and there are others that you can gather. Like if I give a lecture on demonology, uh, I, I'm not looking for academic sources on the left hand path. I'm looking for academic sources in demonology. And there's a, a vast um, a vast scholarship actually on demonology, for instance. So you do have academic uh, resources on that and the same for demonolatry. And then you complement that with primary sources, which are, which are the sources written by practitioners. Even when we write an academic paper, I have uh, several peer-reviewed publications, so I know very well the, the process of peer-reviewed publication. Even when you publish academically, uh, you usually tend to balance primary sources, which are the sources written by, in this case, by practitioners, and uh, secondary sources, which are the academic uh, scholarship analysis to back up your, um, your, your thesis and uh, your argument. So that's, I kind of use a very similar methodology when I do my courses. I, um, I, I use a, a, a good mixture of academic sources and primary sources to, to inform the, the content of my, of my lectures. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that that's fascinating stuff that I would pick up from that is, as far as I know, in the tantric tradition within India itself, tantrics do actually serve their community in the sense of being what Ronald Hutton calls a service magician. People go to tantrics to to get things done in the in their local area, and that might be they might go there for medicine as well which would be the other thing, or they go there for fertility treatments, or, or they go there to curse their neighbours, you know, or whatever, or to win wars. So this, that's, isn't that service to a community as well? Yeah, but all, not all forms of Tantra are left and path. Right. <laughs> there, there are many traditions of Tantra that are not left and path, and others that are. And as I said, the typology that I explained uh, are related to the Western historicism. Yeah. So uh, the left hand path in Indian Tantra is not even hedonistic, it's the opposite of hedonistic. So uh, it's uh, it's very different anyway. So uh, the, what I was describing was the definition of the left hand path in Western historicism, not in Tantra. But um, uh, still in... Uh, the Vamachara Marga, which is the, the left hand path in Tantra, as opposed to the uh, Dakshina Chara Marga, uh, which these are Sanskrit terms. I've studied Sanskrit at university. Um, I, I, in fact, I started from Indian and Tibetan traditions. And then after my master's, I moved more towards contemporary magic uh, practices. 
but yeah the the Vamachara marga in in tantra uh, also has a focus on individualism and self-deification but there's a uh, a stark difference from Western historicism in the in the inclusion of hedonism because the Western historicism one is more hedonistic, whereas um, the the left hand path in tantra is not hedonistic at all. In fact, even when they do practices like sex magic, they do it um, per, you know on purpose with somebody they wouldn't be attracted to, uh, and uh, because the the point there is to break taboos. And the breaking of taboos is part of the antinomianism also in Western historicism. But in Indian Tantra, it's more about uh, overcoming um, material dualism that they want to break through, that they want to break through a sense of um, material dualism that doesn't exist. So in the material world, you see certain things as disgusting and as appealing. And that means that you are not yet Shiva or Shakti, depending on the the, the the tradition of tantra so if you're not the in a god-like state you will perceive the material world in dualistic with a dualistic lens so that some things are appealing and others are disgusting so the point of tantric practices and even for instance se sexual practices to, uh, but also you have extreme uh, traditions in the left hand path in tantra that would like do things that we would consider very disgusting, like eating corpses and feces and, and and such things. So, and the point is to overcome the sense of disgust because as long as you feel that sense of disgust, you're immersed in the in a materialistic dualism that is actually veiling and obstructing your um, your path towards towards your godlike nature. So, it's um, it, there are similarities for sure because. The whole concept of left and path comes from the, um, the comes from tantra, uh, even though it was introduced in Western historicism by um, Elena Petrovna Blavatsky. In the Secret Doctrine, she talks about uh, left and path, and she defines it as uh, black magic, pretty much. So she, she kind of talks about right and path and left and path as white magic and black magic. So she uses a typology from India and. Um, reinterpret it, translate it with uh, the typologies that we at the time had in Western historicism, which was good magic and uh, evil magic, you know, so that's what he, she explained it as, but of course, ever since then, things have evolved. Okay, well, the obvious question for me then is, would you, do you consider Thelema, the or what, well, first of all, do you know what Thelema? Would you define Thelema if you were interested in that? And would you define that as a a magical philosophy of the left hand path or the right hand path? Yes, I would say that Thelema is left hand path. And uh, in fact, I had a an entire interview with uh, Marco Visconti on my YouTube channel about that because. Uh, when I published my online course and he saw that Lima was there, he um, interjected saying that um, it couldn't be left and path because Crowley uh, clearly said that it wasn't left and path. And so I thought that that's interesting. Maybe we could have a, a discussion on that on my YouTube channel. So it is still up if people want to see it. And uh, we discussed pretty much the difference between an emic perspective and etic perspective on on such things because uh, the the perspective. Can you of, explain that as for emic? Yes. Etic. Yeah, yeah. I will explain. I know. I'm. I know that it's not. Uh, these are not terms that are familiar to the general public, but are very familiar to anthropologists. So the emic perspective is the insider's perspective. So in this case, it would be the perspective of the practitioner. And the etic perspective, spelled uh, E-T-I-C, uh, is the perspective of the scholar, of the outsider, the researcher, that is looking at it and defining it. Now, um, I would say, as a, as a scholar, that practitioners are notoriously <laughs> not very good at accurately defining their own practices. And that is because uh, it is for good reasons. It is because they don't, they are not scholars. They don't have as the primary aim in mind to be accurate. The primary aim tends to be how they want to portray themselves in relation to the community they are speaking with uh, and speaking to. So for Crowley, when he was saying that uh, Telima is not left and path, he's, he was working with uh, Plavatsky's definition, not with the definition that we have now after 
years of, of research and uh, the possibility of looking at the span of different traditions. Um, and uh, an example that I give from my field work is that, uh, for instance, I, I have studied the Italian witchcraft and shamanism, uh, and my book has been published recently by Brio. And uh, when I was on, on the field studying Italian witches, they wouldn't call themselves witches, but they are, to all intent and purposes, witches. But the, the reason why they wouldn't call themselves witches is not because what they were doing is not witchcraft, if we want to use the accurate descriptor, but because the term strega in Italian has a very negative connotation as a history of antagonism with the Catholic Church, and they were part of a community that would ostracize them if they were to define themselves as witches. So that's why practitioners have very different um, aims and objectives when they are defining what they are doing. It's not primarily about the accuracy, having the most accurate descriptor. They tend to focus more on how they want to perceive, and that depends a lot on the historical time, on the community they're in, on um, what's their neighborhood like. So there are many elements that play into how, how practitioners define their practices that have nothing to do with accuracy. And that's where the ethic perspective comes into, into place, because uh, since scholars don't really, um, are not really bothered with, with these things, because they are not describing themselves, they are describing a, an anthropological phenomenon in the real world. Um, so it, it, they have, the, in a way, the freedom of um, exercising accuracy, which is a freedom that perhaps practitioners that are living and breathing that practice may not be uh, afforded. For good reasons, it's not a critique. I'm just saying that we need to acknowledge the fact that practitioners just have other aims in mind when they define things. and. Uh, I would argue that accuracy is not um, a priority for most practitioners uh, when they define what they do. So I guess that that answers your question. Well, kind of, sort of. I'm sort of surprised that Crowley would, I suppose Crowley said lots of things, most of which are contradictory anyway. I think often, you know, different points of view. He doesn't have one view even about his own magic as far as i know but uh assuming that he did actually say that somewhere i mean where did where can you remember offhand where he said that we're not that Salima isn't left hand path because when oh. you consider the sort of the, the way his followers like say kenneth grant who wrote his book about crowley pretty much emphasized what him as a left hand path practitioner obviously there's a certain amount of revisionism in in, in kenneth grant but is that really distinctive of Crowley's view? I kind of think most people would be quite surprised by that, given how many yogic and tantric elements there are within Crowley's magic. Hmm. Yeah, um, there, it is something that um, Marco Isconti talks about in the interview, so if people can, can watch that one if they're more interested about it. I can't remember exactly uh, if there is the... If, because he does mention a text where uh, that is uh, clearly stated, but I can't remember it now off, off the top of my head. Um, I think I'll, I'll check that out, and if I can sort of maybe insert the text in there, because that's quite interesting. But anyway, regardless of what, it's, it's like people say, you know, it's this thing, people say Crowley, they say Thelema isn't a religion, right? That's the most common thing that I come across with Thelemites. It's not a religion. And that's, say, another, that's another <laughs> way uh, that practitioners don't accurately define what they do. <laughs> I think you're right about that, but they say it's not really. But then you say, but Crowley calls it, <laughs> he calls it the aim of religion. He certainly says it has the aim of religion. The yeah, for, for Crowley. Of Crowley says that, but yet most Thelemites, I think what they mean is it's not, well, they're, they're saying it's not Christian, really. That's the thing. When, when people talk about religion in, in Britain or in the, in the West, they yeah, I think they mean in Christianity, essentially. They, they're a bit lazy about that. But, yeah, you're right. From a, another point of view, from other practitioners' point of view, yeah, it is a, it is a religion, I would have thought. But he, whatever. But, and Crowley sort of specifically says that. Um, 
Yeah, well, it, that links well with the idea of the amic versus added perspective because, um, uh, I, again, I think the practitioners are not um, very good at accurately describing what the, what they do because they have loaded uh, signifiers like religion for they don't think about what religion actually is as scholars do. They think more about what religion conjures to them and to people to whom they're going to say whether Telema is a religion or not. And uh, for most people, religion means one of the Abrahamic religions, either Christianity or Islam or Judaism. And of course, that's not what religion is and it's not what religion has to be. So I would even argue that people are uh, letting the Abrahamic religions uh, control the discourse. Yeah. control the discourse around what religion even is so um i understand why people say i'm spiritual and i'm not religious and they want to distance themselves from an institutionalized way of um of practicing religiosity but um i would argue that in most cases they are definitely um either being part of a religion or um practicing religious a religious tradition or a religious practice and um, I think that per on a personal level, I think that it is a bit of a shame that people don't want to use the term religion more because they are just leaving uh, the Abrahamic faith to dictate what religion means uh, instead of um, helping redefine the term to encompass more religious practices. How can it not be a religious practice? Something like Telima. But, even others, to be to be honest, even other um, magic practicing traditions are, to all intent and purposes, religions. They're just not resembling monotheisms. But religion doesn't have to mean monotheism, and scholars don't don't think that um, at all. I mean, uh, religious studies scholars have been discussing that for decades at this point. The the term religion doesn't equate with world religions or with monotheistic religions. But it is something that hasn't transpired in the in the community of practitioners, and uh, that's that's um, our fault, I think, because we are not very accessible, and scholarship is not very accessible. And it's one of the reasons why I started my my project to try and bridge the gap. But there's there is so much stuff and so much research that it would be impossible just for me to cover it all. So so going back to that, so. Salima, then. So, would you say Salima, whatever Crowley is supposed to have said, right, in this either sort of obscure or significant text from his point of view, would you say Salima is? Would you define it as a as a left hand path tradition? Yes. Could it? Could yes, it and and even when uh, even during the interview with uh, Marco Visconti that I was mentioning, that I would recommend people watching. Uh, when uh, I described how, from a scholarly perspective, we can define the, the left hand path, he also agreed that the Lima is left hand path. So um, his argument was that it cannot be considered left hand path if we're basing it on um, Crowley's words, because he wouldn't have classified it as such. In fact, the opposite. But um, the definition that he was working with was Blavatsky's definition, and it's not the scholarly definition. So again, it really boils down to whether you are um, defining it against a practitioner's viewpoint or against a scholarly definition that tends to be a bit broader and, and neutral and doesn't take into account how you want to be perceived by a community that thinks this or that. Right. So, so can, you, can you point out what the left-hand path aspects of Thelema are from, from your, in your in your sort well, of pretty, pretty much all of them. You have the individualism, you have the self deification, <laughs> even the idea of um, the, the content and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel is a path towards self deification, um, the discovering your, your one true will. Um, you have the antinomianism. Sure, you do have uh, orders in Tadima like the AA and the OTO, but they still tend to foster those principles. Uh, and there are Telemites that would argue uh, against these orders or being part of these orders because of that antinomian stance. Um, and you have the hedonism and the the focus on the the here and now, not to uh, an afterlife and uh, some other place or some transcendental uh, dimension of the practice. It's more focused on the the material world on the here and now. So you you've got all the the principles of the left hand path really. Right. I mean, something I'm fond of saying is that uh, 
I think, say, with the religious texts like the Book of the Law, Liber Al, uh, and that whole tradition, that there are two views possible even there. We, obviously, you've got the the Crowley. Yeah, I think when you say hedonism, maybe he, he would have said uh, the law of the jungle. I think I think Crowley called it the is the way the the way of the the law of the jungle, as he put it. Uh, I, you know, do what just you know crush everybody. Basically, the strongest will win. That's quite an important theme within Crowley. But then there's this other, I think, more important view within Thelema, which is is about social justice uh, and hedonism, which is the the way of Mart, the Martian interpretation of the Book of Law, which. Crowley was aware of, and he I, apparently he he even accepted that that was a reasonable interpretation of the book towards the end of his life. Although he never forgave his magical son for being a heretic on that, really, because even Crowley knew that the the hedonism, the law of the jungle, is all right as long as as long as they leave him alone. You know, as long as they don't come and steal his property. That's what he says. Don't you know? Obviously, it, I, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. He said, uh, "But have you got any thoughts on the Martin interpretation? And is that still because that's quite, you know? I think, I think that's the best bit of Thelema. Personally, is the Mar the social justice aspect to it, rather than the kind of pseudo Nietzschean law of the jungle. Although a lot of people like that idea. Have you got any thoughts on on that particular philosophy?" Uh, what do you mean by social justice in this case? Well, Freiter Echad said that doing my true will meant serving uh, the community. Yeah. My yeah, yeah, this is something that you also find in the. Okay, okay, I, I got what you mean. So, yeah, um, when I talk about. Um, uh, when the typology of the right-hand path and left-hand path is described, and there's the idea that the right-hand path is more community-based and the left-hand path is more uh, individual. Um, one thing that I uh, I should have said earlier, and I usually uh, clarify, is that uh, it's not uh, individualism doesn't mean selfishness. It's, and in fact, uh, a lot of left-hand path uh, traditions have the idea that even though they are very individualistic, they still think that they are doing something for the community by being individualistic because the idea is that if you are in this case aligned with your one true will then and everybody does it the whole society will benefit from it mm. it's just that the pathway of improving society goes through the individual as opposed to changing something in society actively going out and uh, doing something for other people so it's a uh, it's not like the left hand path is selfish it's individualistic not selfish yeah well well moving on from that then what what, what are your thoughts on crowley himself so we got most people obviously it's a lemic symposium but this, it, over the years sometimes people there's an idea that everybody is sort of into Crowley, but uh, secretly in a way, or it, it's it's there's the philosophy, and then there's this individual who, who channeled it that uh, most people, well, I don't know, you can either separate them or you can treat them as uh, inseparable, really. So, do you have any views on Crowley as a as a guru and a, or as a teacher or as a individual? I think that Crowley was definitely an interesting character, uh, very controversial, and I think that he liked being controversial and contradictory, as you mentioned earlier. Um, my views on Crowley is that he's definitely been incredibly influential. So, I guess uh, looking at it as a um, uh, as a scholar of historicism, I I can't help but appreciate his work just because it's clearly had such a, a strong impact that it means that he, that his work and what he has written and what he has said has reson resonated through decades and decades, impacting so many traditions that came after him. Even though they are different from Telima, but they definitely, you know, Telima was a building block from which they they built their their own tradition. So. Um, I, I like it in that sense. I, I wouldn't say, I think that if I probably met Crowley in person, I wouldn't have liked him at all, to be honest. 
but uh, luckily I'm not um, evaluating him on a human level, but more on a scholarly level. I think there are some characters in history that uh, you, you realize that they have been uh, as important and intellectual or aesthetic milestones for, for us, but at the same time as human beings, they were not the, the best. Um, the, the best person that you would want to hang out hang out with. So um, I appreciate him for his impact and for the ideas and also for the democratization of magic. I think that one of the uh, biggest impact that Crowley has had was democratizing magic, taking it out of close orders and uh, uh, saying, you know, every man and every woman is a star. Everybody can do this. Everybody can practice it. So uh, th that was a, a major contribution that he gave um, to to the esoteric world. Uh, but yeah, he was a. I, I if I had met it in person, I wouldn't have liked him. But since I don't have to meet it in person, but work with his material and his impact on esotericism, then I I like his contribution, but not him as a person. I think maybe that's the problem with gurus in general, you know, that is raised by one of the other speakers is that they can be they can be remarkable people and have a quite they have a genuine physical influence on your on, on your life. But you need to, you probably shouldn't really follow them as, as when they're alive. Uh, it's better better to have dead gurus in a way is my point of view because you know, when you see the other aspects that uh, he was as a as a technical guru, as a teacher, he was rubbish. Basically, uh, he he ended up. A, well, probably all of them do. Uh, is an argument that all gurus uh, kind of end up abusing their students uh, one way or another, even just intellectually, you know, in one way. But. Yeah, no, I, I I think you're right that sort of Crowley was, it's a good figure to have historically in your background, you know, <laughs> as long as he's not still alive, you know, because he was such a kind of love-hate figure from the, but, you know, as I say, I've been doing this thing for a while and we kind of, you can't really get away from him really. And I suppose it's churlish not to honour him, you know, as the person who, for all of his faults and everything, managed to, bring forth a quite deep and interesting set of ideas magically. I think you're right about the the common sense view that that, that book of his, Liber ABA, uh, sometimes called Magic and Theory and Practice, is like a, mo it's a, a modern grimoire, really. It's the best of all of the grimoires of history, a lot of which are pretty bullshitty anyway but this is a sort of sensible one it's it's it, it's the modern grid man he does talk in or mostly in ordinary language uh one way or another so yeah honor to crowley and everything um do you want to say a little bit about without giving too much away about what you're actually going to share with us for your contribution to the symposium yeah although as you said i don't want to uh really give too much away so that people can come along and actually listen to um to the to the paper that i'm going to give or a talk i'm not even sure i don't think that i was told how long it's going to be how long it's going to be i think for you as long as you like <laughs> no i think i don't know i think it's about three quarters of an hour maybe or which you can use in any way you like uh in the sense of you could do half an hour and uh and then take questions although as i say personally i don't i think questions often don't work at events like this they're gonna have a panel anyway for that but yeah three quarters of an hour uh probably could uh yeah you probably have to ask Seth that but i think that's a safe bet which is about what most people can cope with i think before they need a shuffle around or whatever yeah yeah, but my talk is going to be on, um, yeah, on the, in a way, the philosophical and aesthetic lineage from uh, Francois Rebellet and uh, L'Abbé de Thelem, uh, which is this uh, French, um, a French text, um, Gargantua, uh, which uh, talks about the Abbey of Thelema in French. 
Uh, and also there's the foundational motto of this abbey, which is Fesike uh, Vultra, which is uh, do what thou wilt. So I will um, examine whether, you know, the, the potential influence that, um, that this text has played on, on Crowley. Yeah, well, the, it's the history of, because what you're saying is, I suppose what we're kind of referring to is that this philosophy that Crowley, whatever you call it, channeled, would you say he's a channeler of the Book of the Law? Or do you, I don't know if you have a theory about that, where, where this text comes from. But it's not out of thin air. It has a sort of tradition, doesn't it? It has a tradition that goes back perhaps even thousands, thousands of years the idea of Thelema, but it certainly goes back to uh, the book you mentioned, uh, Gagantia and Pantagruel and this Abbey of Thelema, uh, which, as far as I know, I, I, the way I would relate that to Thelema is that um, it's who you let in. <laughs> they don't need any rules in the Abbey of Thelema as long as you filter who gets in. Yeah, would you say that was a fair interpretation of Rabelais' sort of libertarian paradise? That's what the Abbey is. Would you say it's a kind of com it's a community of liberated people? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to spoil it too much. You don't want to because, spoil it, okay? Yeah, I'm, because, I'm, because to, to answer, I will have to go into details, and I yeah, will do that yeah. at the, the symposium. No, it's a fascinating subject, and where I live, just up the road, there's actually, uh, well, there's the Hellfire Club. I think they were kind of very influenced by that, and they they never managed to live it, but they kind of, they're all buried within a, a mausoleum that is the same shape as the uh, Abbey of Thelema, as, as described in Rabelais, apparently. So they made it when they died. <laughs> but uh it, it kind of fell apart as a as a as a new age community but yeah no i'm i'm very much looking forward to that it's a f fascinating subject and i mean i think that's the thing about crowley is that it, he's he leads you into sort of really weird material that you probably most people would never have looked at right if not for crowley i mean who'd have thought who'd, who'd have bothered really so uh but it is actually but the the subject matter of Rabelais, you, you, it it's significant, do you think, and uh, important magically, philosophically? Yes, absolutely. It's something that um, people should definitely look into if they are interested in Thelema. Yeah. So we need to know more about it and to make more of it. Yeah. And we will know more about it. At, um... We will definitely know more about it. <laughs> Is it going to be an illustrated lecture or? Uh, by illustrated you mean with slides if you've got slides any pretty... yeah i will have slides all right brilliant okay um well it just remains then i think we've covered quite a lot of very very interesting ground um is there anything else uh, you, you say you've got a book out uh, as well as the, the uh the the podcast and the and the recordings you've got some written material that people could look at it as well can you tell us a little bit about the book Yes, my book is the result of my PhD. So it's on Italian witchcraft and shamanism, and uh, it covers um, pretty much my doctoral research. I also have another book that I'm co-editing along with Susan Owen called uh, Pagan Religions in Five Minutes uh, for Equinox. Uh, both these books are academic books, so it might not be that easy to to get your hands on, on them. But um, I also have publications that I publish on on my on my website if you go on my website drangelapuka.com uh, you will find that there is a tab with my publications and it leads you directly to academia.edu and uh, you can download my uh, my papers and i'm also planning on writing uh, more commercial books not academic i mean i i'm still planning on public um, publishing academically but also uh, commercially so that it's easier for people to access them and also they will be cheaper because unfortunately academic books are incredibly expensive and uh, authors cannot do anything about it so um, um, and also because of the distribution of commercial books uh, so I'd, I'd like to also write a book on the left and path and uh, and left and path traditions and um, 
uh, as well as um, a more uh, practical book, like a spell book type of thing uh, with uh, with all the, the, the spells that I have retrieved during my research into Italian witchcraft. So these are um, projects for the future. But at the moment, people can find me at uh, my website, drangelapuka.com or on my YouTube channel, Angela Symposium, and on all social media platforms, really. I'm, uh, I'm on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, even though I hate Facebook. Uh, so don't don't follow me there, uh, but you will find me in uh, in all the other places. And of course, you can meet, you can meet Angela in the flesh at uh, at her talk and uh, at the forthcoming symposium in September. And uh, personally, I kind of really like. I know there's all this new social media, which has been brilliant for, from my point of view, for the pagan magical world. Uh, it's really connected us and allowed us to find each other uh, in, in great numbers where it was really, really hard when we first started out. But so, but actually, we, the lesson we learned from the early symposium, actually coming to things and meeting other speakers, but also meeting other practitioners and non-practitioners and people who are interested, it's difficult to find a replacement for that. It really is uh, a, an amazing thing to do and and we've got a kind of physical meetings there's a lot to be said for it plus we do the workshops i don't know if you've had a chance to look at the the program at all uh is there anything else on the program that uh interests you uh from the stuff um i i had a brief look at the program and it seems like there are other uh, very interesting talks. There's also the other keynote, the practitioner keynote, that also seemed quite interesting. So I, I definitely look forward to it and to to meeting people. So if uh, people are listening to this podcast, uh, come along so that you can say hi and uh, can meet me in person. Because I agree, I think that meeting people in person is still the the best way of interacting, really. Okay, Angela, thank you very much for speaking to us about this. Very fascinating talk on Rabelais and uh, the Abbey's Delima that was part of the forthcoming symposium. So it just remains for me to say, uh, Who art thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. 93. <laughs> <Indeed>. Or 93. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.